Marxism. Yeah. Or liberal conservative communism. And that is Slavoj Žižek, Terry Eagleton, Byung Shul Han, and Christopher Lash. Mm. And what I notice is all of them are dealing with these questions of theology. You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content. We think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite. Like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. Philosophers call someone a relative, by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. My simple response to that is this. No one holds that view. No one believes that every view is as good as every other view. Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today I am here with Elijah Emery to talk about Christopher Lash, a highly relevant thinker who has influenced my thinking over the past couple of years. And I uh, first heard of Elijah on uh, Derek Varn's podcast, Varn Vlog, uh, which I listen to quite frequently. I've been on there before. and. Um, Derek Varn was actually on uh, One Dime Radio to talk about Christopher Lash, which was the only time I ever talked about Christopher Lash on this podcast. It was the one, the episode titled Culture of Narcissism, if you haven't listened to it yet. And I saw Elijah's talks with Derek Varn, and he seemed very well read on Christopher Lash. I believe you read all his works. Yeah, I did my, I did my undergraduate thesis on Christopher Lash. So I read all of his books two to three times, and I've read a number of his works outside of his written books, but I'm, I'm better versed in the books. Thanks for, for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I always like having people who are very invested in certain thinkers who've done the reading, who you can tell are about it in terms of truly grasping the concepts and doing the work necessary to uh, un unpack it. The question we always ask on this show when we talk about any thinkers, we only have so much time and energy to discuss big ideas and thinkers. Why should we give a shit about this one? Why should we care about Christopher Lash? Why does he matter? So I think there's two reasons, one of which is defensive and one of which is critical. The defensive reason is that in recent years, a number of thinkers on the right have picked up Christopher Lash and attempted to use him to vocalize a form of almost hair in vogue socialism, which I think is pretty incompatible with his work, but has led to a situation where his theories can give a a veneer of sense to ideas on the right, which I think would be otherwise more theoretically lacking. Or in the podcasting world, also Red Scare popularized Christopher Lash to a great extent uh, to use him as an analysis of present culture in a way which I think is not wholly accurate, but uh, lends itself to a situation where there's a huge number of people who are vaguely aware of Christopher Lash and can use him purely as a means of criticizing the contemporary culture war. For that reason, it's important to understand what he really thought so that anything which is inaccurate can be criticized and a more accurate view of his work can be disseminated. I think the broader reason and the thing which I find most compelling about him is that he is a left-wing thinker who is focused on the American context. There's a great tendency among a lot of the left going back at this point about 75 years, if not longer, to focus on the adoption of styles of revolutionary politics, which may be somewhat relevant to our context, but are not super, super apt ways of describing the situation in the developed world. And I think of this in the prioritization of, say, Maoism or Leninism, which are revolutionary movements that developed in the context of peasant republics and non-industrial countries for the most part. 
it's very different to think about what revolution and what socialism entails in a Western context. And Christopher Lash is a very good explanator of, or explicator, excuse me, of how the history of America and the peculiarities of the American condition relate to the possibilities and weaknesses of a socialist or a populist politics in the United States. He's clearly coming from a left point of view and a materialist point of view in many ways. He's, he seems very well versed in Marx's political economy and he's making, he's touching on issues that I notice a lot of people on the left are a little afraid to even to think about. And they're typically monopolized by the right, such as issues like the uh, decline of the family and the decline of two parent households, critiques of the 60s, individualism, therapism, stuff that tends to be monopolized by reactionaries. But he analyzes it using a lot of political economy in a very nuanced way. And of course, Christopher Lash is most famous for books like Culture of Narcissism and Revolt of the Elites. But I think a good way to go through Christopher Lash's work and his main ideas, because that's really what this podcast is going to be about, is an exposition of his main ideas, sort of like a guide. So if anyone who wants to go read Christopher Lash, they, can, they have something to expect. They have a, a framework to go and read with. Because there's many themes we could touch on. Of course, there's his critique of the 60s, his critique of the new left, progressivism, capitalist education, the family, individualism, etc. And his analysis for those who've read Lash and Culture of Narcissism is about far more than a critique of the me generation. It's not exactly like what Adam Curtis does in Century of the Self, although there's parallels of that. It's very altogether quite different. There's a lot of psychoanalysis there. So I figure to start is why not go with one of the early things Christopher Lash was analyzing, sort of how he started off, because you see a sort of trajectory in his work. I believe his early works that kind of put him on the map was his, his critique of the American left, new, new radicalism in America, and then later agony of American left. Yeah. So... These are about slightly different things, though there's obviously overlap. I like to tie in the new radicalism in America to Lash's first book, which is The American Liberals and the Russian Revolution, where I think if you read that book, which almost no one read, reads, it's very difficult to get a hold of. This first book is an analysis of the Russian Revolution through the lens of American liberals at the time. And what it reveals is a tendency by American liberals to see the Soviet Union as something that can't be compromised with because it's a threat to the internal revolutionary tradition of the United States. You either have a teleology of liberal revolution or you have a teleology of socialist revolution. And I think the new radicalism is basically thought of as an attempt to understand how these people got situated in a dominant position within American culture and within American politics. It's an analysis of the undercurrents that led to the development of progressivism as an ideology, which includes both variants we might think of as centrist and variants we might think of as left-wing. The new radicalism kind of traces this development of a cultural milieu, um, which combines both intense cultural power and insiderism with a self-perception as a something akin to a technocratic elite or a disinterested elite or a Brahmin elite based on critical thought and a desire to use rationality to reorganize society and eliminate conflict. In this elite, there's a valorization of the lower classes and simultaneously an attempt to assimilate them into dominant modes of culture. So this is like progressivism, right? Yeah. That's its high point, but he sees this, this cultural milieu as something very important because it forms kind of the basis for the liberalism, which is in power and in vogue during most of the time of his early career. These are the people who are the ancestors of the people that the new left is rebelling against. You might think of the final flowering of this new radicalism as the Kennedy administration, this perception of the best and brightest who are using their own education, and their own belief in the abilities of a technocratic elite to effectively meet the needs of the lower classes, while at the same time usurping the democracy that they claim to value by constantly furthering 
a technocratic style of governance. This is, of course, an intense simpl simplification, and I want to make sure everyone is aware of this. If you read these books, you're going to find a lot more undercurrents, but I think that this is the most important thing you pick out of this. Then we get to Lash's more clearly left-wing period. You might think of him in the New Radicalism in America and the American Liberals in the Russian Revolution as an in internal critic of liberalism. He's got a constant thread of um, desire for accommodation with the Soviet Union and a skepticism of the ability of social engineering to effectively solve social problems. But he didn't fully become radical until the 1960s, the mid-1960s and the late 1960s, when he was a fellow traveler with much of the academic new left. And the Agony of the American Left, which is written in it has a number of essays, but basically the late 60s, it comes out in 1969, is an analysis of the cultural history of the left in the United States and the opportunities and weaknesses of liberalism in what was then the present. Probably the most important narrative which he draws in that book is a description of the populists of the late 1800s, the socialists of the early 1900s, and the communists and black nationalists of the 1930s, and considers them part of one kind of tradition of left-wing counter movement to a dominant liberal society. And he identifies the new left as members of this tradition. This is a really important thing because what he's trying to do there is teach the new left about the inadequacies and weaknesses of prior left-wing movements in American history. In the case of the populists, it's an ideological weakness, a kind of conspiratorial worldview which fails to actively crystallize into something that can exist beyond just in opposition to the status quo. In the case of the socialists, it's an over-reliance on foreign thought like Leninism rather than in a, a, an attempt to meet American conditions. The basic point is that he sees all of these left-wing forces historically as having certain problems in terms of their ideological self-conception, their strategy, which threatened to repeat in the new left. And he adds to this, the new left's over-reliance on alienation, which is the reason it's vocalized primarily as a student movement, and which is threatening because if you're reliant on alienation, it makes it difficult to actively construct a, a, a counter systemic force beyond just in opposition to the status quo. So the reliance on alienation is a critique of Correct. the new left, not of the 30s left, right? Because that'd make more sense because you have more stereotypical unionism in, in the 20s, 30s the tens, but then in the new left, you have it's the left increasingly becomes more based in a universe. More based in minority groups who are alienated from society. And this isn't like a total critique. Alienation, Lash also says, is a lot of what's fruitful about the new left, that it's expanding a critique of the economic system to a critique of American culture as a whole. But it's threatened by an inability to see history and to learn the lessons of the past and an inability to move beyond this activating alienation to a more disciplined form of politics. He moves then to the last book in his sort of cultural history of the left, which is The World of Nations, which is written in 1972 and is an analysis, or sorry, 1974, I think, and is a, an afterwards analysis of a new left, which he sees as having failed where he reiterates a number of the themes that he had talked about previously, a failure to learn from history, an over-reliance on alienation, and also eventually in the form of McGovernism, a subsumation into the Democratic Party. Right. George McGovern, who famously ran against Richard Nixon and, and lost by a pretty insanely wide margin. Also within the world of nations is further analysis on the beginnings of liberalism and liberal thought and a movement towards the kind of structural analysis, which he'd become more famous for 
in Haven in a Heartless World and some of his later works, which talks about institutions and basically the way that they disseminate a dominant liberal view of society, which simultaneously appears very weak and also difficult to overcome for some reason. Right. Yeah. And and then Haven in a Heartless World is the essay collection where he starts to analyze much of the same things as culture of narcissism, correct? So Haven in a Heartless World is his history. And it's basically an attempt to identify why it is that liberal ideology was unable to be defeated by the new left. So his conclusion is that the reconstruction of the family as a purposeful project by liberalism to create subjects more amenable to a cooperative society, cooperative in, in a liberal capitalist sense, not in a socialist sense, and to ameliorate the possibility of conflict, developed the personality type and the, the social subject, which he talks about more clearly in the culture of narcissism, i.e. the narcissist, a personality type which is on the surface, very cooperative, but beneath the surface, riven with a lot of internal conflicts. We'll get into culture and narcissism for sure. There's a lot to talk about in that. But the, from what I understand is with Haven in a Heartless World and culture and narcissism, you started to see him analyzing the climate uh, after the counterculture and the aftermath of, of the new left and the failure of the new left. The, I still would like to clarify is what is his main critique in agony of American left of the new left? Yeah. So basically they didn't learn from the past. They were insufficiently disciplined and they didn't make the effort to build a new party. They tried to take over the Democratic Party. That's like the main three problems as he sees. Because what I found interesting is a lot of the things he analyzes in culture and narcissism, at least, such as for example, the, well, there's some of the stuff is stuff that people be fairly familiar mm -hmm. with, like the turn inward, the, mm -hmm. the retreat from politics, the self-actualization mm -hmm. movement, certain, se like the sexual revolution and these moves to revolutionize culture. These things that do happen are also championed by the new left in many respects, but the culture that he's, the new culture of capitalism, some later would call the new spirit of capitalism that seems to be emerging, which he's looking at, in many ways seems to reflect elements in the new left, which is a hard thing to grapple with. And that's one thing I, I thought that was a little bit interesting is he's questioning certain things that I guess are yeah. taken for I mean, granted I, I on think the left. I think a large part of this um, is that He's very interested in this long durée analysis of culture. And something to remember is that the new left, mm. of course, is a primarily youth movement. And so it's an arena in which we can mm. detect earlier than in the remainder of society, the changes that have been caused by a transformation in the way in which people are socialized in, in, in terms of the family. And the politics as a result are a reflection of those sociological changes. So Haven in a Heartless World is going to attempt to say like, well, what is it about these people that makes it so difficult for them to do the things that Lash wants them to do? And it's the basic conclusion is, well, they've, and society has been reconstructed in such a way as makes a genuine radicalism more difficult because some of the structures to maintain capitalism have been effectively implanted in the self, which can be overcome because people still have agency, but which you have to recognize mm. and deal with on an individual as well as a social level. That's something that a big theme in a culture of narcissism is the socialization of everyday life in a capitalism in the way that certain dominant hegemonic ideological state apparatuses or ideological apparatuses, if you will, come to like such as the education system such as consumerism popular media come to replace a lot of functions that the family once placed that's the yeah. theme of it I, I think more more broadly even than the family the private realm becomes public and when people think of this uh 
I think often on the left, the natural inclination is to assume that a, a publicization of life is a net positive because we think of a socialist society, which of course has the mm -hmm. word social in it, but your life can be publicized in a way which is not actually amenable to socialist goals at all, um, but merely includes you in a system of consumer capitalism. And I, I think this is something that Lash is very good on, is pointing out that these ideas which we think of as intrinsically linked to socialism aren't necessarily. They can be done in a capitalist way or a socialist way. And what matters in terms of determining that are the institutions we create and the type of politics we have more broadly. Some people might hear we talk about the family and then a bell will ring in their head and they'll think, this is crypto fascism. It was very obvious to me that the in the culture of narcissism is a critique of capitalism. It is a critique of capitalist culture, but I guess it, it is worth breaking down. I mean, what is his analysis of the family? Yeah, I, I think basically a good way to think about it is the ideas he develops in Haven in a Heartless World are, are, are visualized through the analysis of society he comes to in culture of narcissism. The culture of narcissism is a result of changes in the family, above all else in his mind. He talks about the changes in the family as this concept called the socialization of reproduction, which he sees as a mirror of the socialization of production. And what he means by this is not that society has become socialist, but that just as production has moved away from a smallholder, more agrarian system before to large bureaucratic institutions, which are elements that strengthen the hold of capitalism in the United States and in the world, uh, the same process has occurred in the family, where elements that were previously private to small groups of people have instead been in, given away to bureaucratic agencies. It's important to remember that this is the high point of, uh, so there's an ambitious liberal welfare state, which is meant to address many of the problems that come with capitalism while maintaining its underlying function, and which in combination with the education system and a new therapeutization has more effectively transformed individuals into ideal subjects under a capitalist ideological system. So his va he, he doesn't really have a valorization of the family, which is, I think, something that people misunderstand. He's pointing out that the family, which is previously a more neutral institution, and it should be added, previously an institution um, which offered a, a modicum of protection to people because it had so many economic fun functions and social functions attached to it, uh, and also, which was previously a more extended family, um, is slowly transformed into a nuclear family, which is more amenable to the capitalist order at that time, weaker, offers less protection, and is also under greater duress because it's been shorn of anything beyond the function of emotional reg regulation. Basically, it's an institution which is meant to provide law, while the remainder of society is meant to provide discipline. And this leads to its inadequacy as a means of effectively creating subjects who are able to master themselves. Right. And he's clearly not fetishizing or valorizing the nuclear family because in the culture of narcissism, I, I forget the exact quote, but I believe he says the family is declining for, has been declining for like over a century or something. Because if you take a typical right wing view, they think the 50s was everything was just fine. When he's actually critiquing that culture in uh, new radicalism, right? So it's, he's coming from a very different point of view. But the one, th correct me if I'm wrong, but one thing I got out of cultural narcissism was that the family, regardless of oppressive social norms, regardless of uh, subjugation of women, patriarchy, et cetera, the family was a barrier, one of the last barriers to capitalist socialization. It was like a shield from it in a certain sense, because it was a way in which people could be socialized outside capitalist orbit. Not only that, it's, it's an arena in which you have some. So um, I think, you know, people fairly point out, and Lash also pointed this out, he was an early scholar of First Wave, for example, including more radical currents within it, which didn't win out eventually. 
uh, and contained a broader critique of the... But I mean, I think one overarching thing to think about is, well, you're most effectively able to inst influence the institutions uh, closest to you. And so you can exert your own influence over your family. And if your parents, the way you raise your children, as compared to like influencing the education system as a whole, which is way more difficult. So he's treating it as an institution which both had previous economic functions, which meant that people weren't dependent on society as a whole, meaning a capitalist interdependent society, and therefore preserved some agency. And then in terms of child rearing and sociability, also preserved some agency and some autonomy. So this is almost an, an autonomous view, which prioritizes the ability of people to democratically decide how every institution in their own life functions and supports a sort of democratization of family life, not meaning necessarily that like kids are able to vote on whether they have bedtime, but just that families are able to retain some influence and organize themselves to create kids that they like rather than kids that are like really well trained to fit in with society. Though, so how exactly did this change happen? Because from Lash, the way I understood it is it's largely economical due to obligations, changing obligations. But also there's this passage about how the families are now, parents are increasingly relying on manuals from experts on how to coach their kids. And how also teachers are performing roles of parents increasingly. It's funny because it's what Mark Fisher says in Capitalist Realism. He has this, uh, this funny quote. I forget from which book it is. It's either from Culture of Narcissism or Even in a Heartless World, where he talks about the choice being between super state or super ego, basically meaning like either you're going to have a society where the state runs more aspects of your life or you're going to cultivate people who have the internal self-discipline necessary to be good social creatures. And the alteration in the family, which is both cultural, he says, they're not cultural independently of economic structures, and an economic institutional change performed at the behest of government institutions, capitalist leaders, and well-meaning those often misguided cultural reformers has the effect basically of promoting a super state and a nanny state, which is often thought of now as a conservative critique because the result of this critique was the dismantling of the welfare state with nothing put in its place. In Lash's mind and in the minds of a huge number of new left radicals, the bureaucratic state was something to be opposed and bureaucracy was something to be opposed because it limited the ability of people to act democratically. The thing he's really interested in and really good at is the same thing which Marcuse is most famous for, which is an analysis of Freud plus Marx, what happened. Yeah, that's a perfect segue because I wanted to get into Christopher Lash's psychoanalysis and what exactly is his theory of narcissism because, of course, his theory of narcissism is quite more sophisticated than our typical understanding of it. So yeah, I would like to just get yeah. into what is his theory of narcissism because he talks about the ego ideal a lot and that's very confusing, not just for people who don't know any Freudian psychoanalysis. It was confusing to me because I've been quite versed in Lacan for the past few years and the mm -hmm. way he uses it's different from the way Lacan uses it. So I was a bit thrown off. So I think a good way to start this is I'm going to say these are the two books which are most important here. We basically cover Haven in a Heartless World. We're saying that this is the book which tracks the causes of the kind of cultural analysis and Freudo Marxism that Lash covers in two books Culture of Narcissism, his most famous book, and also not one of my favorites, actually, and The Minimal Self, which is my favorite of Lash's books and should really be read together because he makes a number of errors in his analysis of narcissism in the culture of narcissism which he then fixes and describes in more detail in the minimal self. So here's what the cultural culture of narcissism is not. It is not an analysis of how culture operates in our own time. It is a portrait of what Lash thinks, the result of both changes in the family and the economic incentives of the 1970s 
result in during that period. This is a period where there's large bureaucratic institutions. Labor unions are still fairly strong. There is a ability for the average worker, especially the average white collar worker, um, to serve at one institution for the entirety of their lives and become very culturally tethered to it and very fairly cared for. They get like a pension or whatever. And he says that one of the results of this is the development of narcissism, which is a tendency to blur the boundaries between the self and the outside world and present oneself as a grandiose subject who is linked to the institutions that they are a participant in. At the most basic, it's, I work for this corporation. This corporation is me. And this is played out in a number of fields, he says. It's played out in economics, in the case of over-reliance and identification with the welfare state and the corporation. It's played out in culture, where there's a valorization of, say, sport that illegitimizes self-performance of sport and also a recognition that your team is not you, basically. So he's critical of the professionalization of sports because he thinks it um, d discourages true sportsmanship and de-democratizes sports, which is not like the best chapter in the book, but is like a good example of a cultural element here. And it's very important to say that what he says about all this is that this is a means of self-defense for people. This is a way in a world which is actually getting more aggressive to kind of paper over some of these conflicts by defensively posturing oneself within institutions and ideas which are larger than. So this is the culture of narcissism. The minimal self adds to this a recognition of primary narcissism, which is something that Lash misses in the culture of narcissism. And he articulates this through these two figures, Prometheus and Narcissus from Greek myth. Prometheus is the secondary narcissism he's talking about. It's an over-reliance on identification with the products of humanity, especially with technology, and a belief that technology will be a liberating thing that will enable us to move beyond the alienation and problems we have today to a better and brighter tomorrow. One of the things he dislikes about Marcuse is he thinks he leans too heavily into this. Narcissus is this primary narcissism, this oceanic yearning for union with the world, which he says derives from like a kind of an attempt to recreate the contentment of the womb. And this is a tendency which blurs the boundaries between the self and the outside world. And I think it's most interesting when articulated through the lens of what the market has become for people which is an institution which is almost equivalent to nature in its effects. It's something that you can fully see yourself as part of and gives you this feeling of control when you're, say, passing over a couple of dollars to buy something that attempts to paper over the fact that you really have very little control. If I buy a phone, I might possess the phone, but I have no idea how to make it. I have no idea how to maintain it. And this is true of basically every commodity in society now. Um, so it's something which creates this drive for union with other things that are larger from you as a defense, while at the same time furthering the actual situation, which is that in modern society, you have less control over your life than ever. And it culminates in this view of the necessity of a new post-industrial culture which is premised on an awareness of our limitations and a recognition that now in a society where we have the ability to construct great technological marvels and huge institutions, the things which are most meaningful to us are going to come from within. And it's a plea for self-mastery uh, and an argument that rather than an instrumental view of the world, which prioritizes ends, we prioritize means and practice and learning how to be really good people. And this is a political argument because Lash thinks that the result of this, the result of a focus on self-discipline and practice, is the possibility, ultimately, of a politics beyond capitalism, which can only be the result of basically tremendous self-discipline by everybody in society. And a lot of people dislike this, 
because it winds up sounding extremely conservative. It's yeah, it a little like, like self-help, but which is a problem of the late lash is that he realizes this, he doesn't want to sound like self-help and he wants to find a politics that can do this on a mass basis, but he has a difficult time finding one because there isn't really a politics that prioritizes these values and the creation of this type of social subject. And that, that might be a good segue to True and Only Heaven, which is his attempt to do this. Yes, but I, before that, is uh, that sounds remarkably like the trajectory of Michel Foucault, because Foucault, of course, he spends all his time, his whole career, just untangling all these big structures that are larger than life, larger than the individual, only to, at the very end of his career, have his lectures be the culture of the self. That's his analysis, right? And he's all he's interested in uh, Epicurus and uh, a lot of the Stoics mm -hmm. and the ancient and Greeks. And Lash does, you know, he's articulating this theory of narcissism, of course, through the mm -hmm. ancient Greeks, through the, the mythology of the past. And it should be added, Lash is one of the left-wing thinkers in the United States who's plugged into Foucault the earliest. He's, rec he's uh, writing about Foucault's theories in the early 1970s. Mm -hmm and focusing a lot on discipline and punish and madness and civilization. Could that be a consequence, though, of depoliticization? Because in the 80s and 90s are peak depoliticization. I think there's a, a good quote, I forget by who, about Lash, which is that people think he turned rightward like the neoconservatives did, who, of course, also start out as nearly Trotskyists, socialists, Lash didn't turn rightward, he turned inward. Um, and you get a lot of his finest, yeah, it's ironic, but you, you get a lot of his finest analysis there, but it winds up looking a little unsatisfied. And I think that the use of the minimal self is also an articulation of what the social subject looks like under neoliberal capitalism, which is a self which is more atomized, more reliant on technology and the market and even less on social institutions than it was in the 1970s is more lost and is more helpless and more in need of, of remedial politics that could offer a way out and yet less able to get that than ever because of these same changes. Just before we go on to um, true and only heaven, I would like to maybe get some little clarification on narcissism. Is So the way I understand it is well, he starts off talking about, well, what is narcissism is we're humans, we depend on each other. And narcissism is this natural condition of, as a child, you have this dependence on your parents, because unlike most animals, we're pretty much helpless until throughout childhood, really. So what happens, in, we develop narcissism as a coping mechanism for this dependence. That's, that's exactly it. Um, and that's a, that's a great explanation. And his application to why we're becoming more narcissistic, right, is we're more dependent on these extra familial structures. We're just more dependent, period, on technology, on all these things. Yeah. And we want to rebel against this, basically. And there's two ways of rebelling against it. One is you like pretend like, oh, I'm so powerful. I'm not dependent. They're actually dependent on me. And that's <laughs> the like secondary narcissism, which he's talking about in the culture of narcissism. Then there's the other thing where it's like, no, it's not that they're dependent on me. I'm literally them. They are me. And that's primary narcissism. You get like this self-actualization therapism, and then you get what people call the PMC, the professional managerial class, who are, I, I'm going to mm -hmm. play my role in society by being the machine yeah. in a certain sense, fixing the machine from within and administering life. Because I, I use that as a segue because... I know you want to go to true and only heaven. We'll, we'll go on to progress mm. and its, its critics, the true and only heaven. So this is, it's got like two parts basically, and goes back into a lot of themes he talked about early in his career. So from this period on, there's no more Freudianism. This is done. It's lurking in the background if you've read him, because obviously when he spent so much time on, this is going to be a factor in his thinking from here on out, but it's not an explicit thing. He goes into it a little bit in Revolt of the Elites with his analysis of like William Reich. But for the most part, there's no more Freudianism. So there's a two part, there's two parts of the true and only heaven, basically. The first part 
is a historical analysis of the idea of progress, which I think basically represents a crystallization of Lash's analysis of liberal ideology as a whole. He thinks that this is the most important factor in defending liberal ideology, not him defending it, obviously, but it defending itself. We just keep moving. There's going to be more material goods. There's going to be things are better now than they've ever been. And he contrasts this idea of progress and optimism with hope and memory. So progress is contrasted to memory, meaning that like in progress, the past is a foreign country. There's no way to recapture anything from the past. There's just a, there's just a, a future. There's not even a present almost. And this is contrasted to memory in Lash's mind, which is this idea of solidarity between the past, present, and future. And I think this is not really articulated in a Marxist way, but it is intuitively Marxist, where you think of capital as, you know, dead labor, almost. Basically, it's the idea that our present circumstances are not the result of an inexorable teleology in Lash's mind. They're the result of the actions of people in the past that have a inconceivable effect on our lives in the present. And I do think this is somewhat unsatisfying. I should add, um, this is a hard contrast to maintain because you say, okay, we have memory. It's opposed to like this cheap nostalgia. Now, what does it do? And in Lash's mind, it uses the past as a wellspring from which we can gain the strength to pursue a truly radical politics in the future. This is also a difference between optimism and hope, which are the two means by which these ideologies or ways of thinking about the sweep of history are articulated. The optimistic tradition, which is the liberal tradition, the capitalist tradition, is things will always get better. Just trust me on this, guys. The hopeful tradition is, yeah, it's, it's Stephen, Stephen Pinkerism, Pinker. basically. The hopeful tradition is one which recognizes that there's like a possibility that things aren't going to get better, but has this deep-seated trust in justice and the possibility of humanity and says that, well, we can do it, guys. And the second half of the book is Lash's attempt to root these two things, memory and hope, in a variety of political movements over the sweep of American history, which he calls like populist movements, basically. This is funny because, as people may remember, in The Agony of the American Left, he's really critical of populism because he says it lacks an ideology. So if we're being generous, this is Lash discovering that populism has an ideology, which happens to perfectly complement his theory about a politics of limits that's articulated at the end of the minimal self as the antidote for a narcissistic culture. And if we're not being generous, it's him curating basically a mythos to provide to radical movements in the 1990s at a time when the left is like in a state of total disarray and basically does not exist in the United States. Um, Lashes, I, um, I think I, I should just talk about um, Lashes like favorite historical example of hope, which is the civil rights movement under MLK, um, which he thinks of as a movement which is really rooted in a sense of place, in a sense of justice, and through their religious faith, has the ability to withstand the oppression of a racist society to create the possibility of a, a genuinely multiracial democracy. It should also be added in all this that Lash is getting more critical of socialism, but not really rejecting socialism as, its, as a broad tradition. He's still very much in favor of the Western Marxist tradition. He's rejecting this kind of narrow socialism that has developed in the period after the New Left, which is a mostly cultural movement, which basically ignores economics for a lot of the 1970s, sorry, the 1980s and 1990s. And so it's basically a rejection of what he thinks socialism has become, which is also a product of personal feuds he's been having for the duration of the 80s and his expulsion from a lot of the left 
over what they see as a kind of a, reje- a, a, a genuine, but I think also overblown rejection of feminism and the cultural politics of a lot of the new. The other thing, which I think is worth mentioning in The True and Only Heaven, is Lash's analysis of the PMC thesis and the new right, which in those days was like Buchananite rage against the liberal elite. Lash seems unwilling to see the PMC as a genuinely new class. He sees what we would, might think of as the PMC as a new style of administering capitalism. But in this way, it's not really a, cla- a departure from earlier class theories. And he thinks that the theory is like untenable because it has so many internal problems at defining who members of the new class are. And talks about how especially the new right uses a new class PMC analysis to just like bash liberalism, basically, and this cultural liberalism while Mm -hmm. doing the bidding of big business, which I think is a totally accurate critique even today. You brought up a bunch of points there, some of which I I saved for the back room parts, which include the question of Mm -hmm. Christopher Lash's populism and also the looming question, was he conservative? What, were his, what was going on with his views on religion? We can discuss that in the back room, but one thing that I think is pivotal right before, real quickly, is there's two themes that I actually thought were the most interesting to me in culture and narcissism, which I think are very vital discussions at the very least to at least gloss over, to gloss on, to, ref, to references. One is the schooling and the new illiteracy. That's, of course, uh, one of the chapters of culture of narcissism. But paradoxically, despite all his his anti-elitism, his critique of the managerial class, he has the chapter, the socialization of reproduction and the collapse Mm -hmm. of authority. What do you see getting at? So in schooling in the new new illiteracy, at its most basic, it's basically like the job of the education system is not to really educate people anymore. It's to create good social subjects for capitalism. And the effect of this is, in his mind, a de-emphasis on things which are like not economically useful, like the humanities. Coincidentally, he's a historian and an overemphasis on, say, like military research and a integration of the school system into business and the military, which is something that he talks about in his earlier books, too. It's a it's an ongoing critique of his in the collapse of authority. I think this is a really important point, which often gets mistaken as a purely conservative viewpoint. So. What's important about the collapse of authority is it, it's a collapse of earned authority, which is connected to self-discipline, the work ethic, things which he doesn't reject, even though we often think of them as conservative values, and a prioritization of systems of authority which have different rules for the people at the top and people at the bottom. So a good example of this is that he sees in, say, Watergate, an example whereby there's an, an impression on the whole of the people that you have to listen to your president, you have to listen to your authority figures because they're the best of us. They represent American aspirations and American hopes better than anybody. And there's then a perception which develops, which is quite correct, and which is talked about also in The True and Only Heaven, where, well, you look at the top and that, especially after Watergate, there's a bunch of rule breakers in charge. And if you're going to have this, how is it that they can tell people that they have to work hard and play by the rules when it's so clear that they're not doing the same thing? So this is connected to a broader question of the collapse of democracy, where there's no structures to discipline the people who are supposed to be in charge. And what's left is an empty husk of authority and nothing else. Good segue before we end the public part and move to the uh, patrons only part to the revolt of the elites, which is his last book. Yeah. Excellent segue. And that brings us into a very interesting discussion, which I'm really excited is the whole discussion about this decline of certain forms of authority, but in a intensification of other forms of authority. And what is this void (laughs) that people are left with? And when certain structures are teared down, what do we replace them with? Does capitalism just replace them? And also the whole question about religion. So we'll we'll get straight into that in the Backroom episode. 
become a patron if you haven't already. What are you doing? If you haven't already, there's a lot of exclusive content. Great way to support the channel. Yeah. Peace out. Take care. Give a five-star rating. Thanks for having me. My only hope is that when enough people become pessimist, then out of despair, somebody maybe does something. But you know why I also like to be a pessimist? Because it's the only way to have a nice life. If you're an optimist, then always bad things happen and you are always disappointed. When you are a pessimist, then you look around, okay, there are bad, but from time to time something nice happens and you are, as a pessimist, you are a little bit glad all the time, no? You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get